Good morning, everyone. Uh, really excited to uh, be talking here today about teleportation, not the teleportation of people uh, across space and galaxies like in Star Trek. Unfortunately. But, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. But uh, we have to start somewhere. So teleportation of digital assets across blockchains with CCIP. Uh, so you, you have heard of CCIP, the cross-chain interoperability protocol that Chainlink is developing. Actually, it's progressing quite well. And uh, in the very near term, in a few weeks, we will kickstart some alpha testing with a select few users on the testnet. And one of those users is, uh, is Synthetix. So um, with their Synth teleporter uh, use case, specifically. Um, Synthetix, I don't think it uh, needs an introduction to this audience. It's one of the OGs in the DeFi space here since day one, and uh, not planning on leaving, I think. Uh, <laughs> also using Chainlink for over three years, our price feeds. And um, I think recently they really um, delivered a great performance in the, in the start of the summer compared to the rest of the market, which was, and still is, a bit of a downturn. But uh, so, uh, yeah, really excited to have you guys join us for alpha testing with the Teleporter um, use case. I'm Peter Powells. I'm the go-to-market lead for CCIP. And Noah, you want to? Yeah, uh, my name is Noah Lippman. I'm a core contributor on Synthetix. Yeah. For those few people that might not know what Synthetix is, maybe can you? Yeah, yeah. Um, Synthetix is a, a derivatives liquidity protocol. So um, we're, we're, we're solving a, a problem of, uh, essentially, um, it's a protocol where users can, um, stakers can deposit collateral, and then that's used to back uh, derivative synthetic assets. So there's synthetic USD. Um, there are various types of markets, but in a in a uh, spot market, for instance, you could then exchange that into synthetic Bitcoin, synthetic euros, um, and whatever price feeds are available. Cool. So as I mentioned, um, really had a standout performance in the start of the summer. Can you elaborate on some of the reasons for that, or what is it that happened that made you stand out so much? Yeah, yeah. So uh, a big spike in revenue came from something called uh, cross-asset swaps. So basically, um, there are order routers like uh, One Inch, which look for the the best price for users to exchange from one asset to another. So if you were trying to fill um, a very large order on chain of let's say ETH to uh, USDC, um, it would find the cheapest route would go from like a curve pool from let's say ETH to SETH use synthetics to exchange from SETH into SUSD, and then back through a uh, curve from SUSD to USDC. And the reason uh, synthetics is able to fill large orders um, at a cheaper price is because there's no slippage. There, because it doesn't have an AMM model, um, the fees are um, just sort of w whatever the protocol determines. So, so we can um, simulate slippage or apply different fee structures. But in any case, it's possible to fill very large orders uh, without being constrained by the amount of liquidity available in a pool. Cool. Um, I understand you have a big new release uh, coming up, V3, and that Synth Teleporters is part of that release. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on what are Synth Teleporters? How do they work? Why do, you, why do we need them? Um, I think it would be useful. Yep, yeah. Um, so in V3, we're going to be approaching cross-chain a little bit differently, but I'll explain it in terms of uh, sort of the current protocol and how it works right now. Um, currently, Synthetix is deployed on mainnet in Optimism, and we're using a, um, an oracle that reads essentially the amount of collateral and the amount of debt issued um, on both of those uh, chains, and then it reports the sum of them to both of the chains. So that allows the protocol to essentially have assets backed um, by collateral on L1 um, when, when the debt might be issued on L2, vice versa. It's all um, fun fungible, essentially, right? So uh, if we wanted to move an asset uh, from one chain to another, uh, all, all that needs to happen is we need to burn the asset on one chain, send a message, and then mint the equivalent amount of assets on the other. Um, again, there's no constraints around like uh, liquidity um, in pools sitting on either chain waiting to pick it up, because all of the accounting uh, doesn't really care uh, sort of where, where the collateral's living. Um, so again, it's a big opportunity to be able to do cross-chain in a potentially more efficient way, sort of on the same principle the cross-asset swaps are working. And what blockchains are you looking at for the Synth teleporters? Um, so initially, we're, we're uh, going to roll out V3 on mainnet and then Optimism, where we are currently. Uh, but a big part of the V3 effort is to make the protocol more uh, generic. So um, you know, whatever governance decides, whichever chain's governance decides are appropriately secure and decentralized, we should be able to move there as well. No. 
I think a lot of people, when we talk about multi-chain, they say the future is multi-chain, but arguably we are all already here. Yeah. Um, if you look at uh, liquidity, used to be all on Ethereum mainnet, um, is now going more and more to the L2s and other L1s. I don't think will will leave uh, very soon. So uh, I think we need that uh, interoperability in in that world uh, between blockchains and not just for token transfers, but also communication, because. Um, um, I think CTIP, what we aim to provide is a single interface so that you can do messaging or token transfers or both in one transaction, all via one smooth interface. Um, you have written about it before and also Kane in his mid-year perspective on synthetics that it um, was decided that waiting for Chainlink CCIP was worth it. Without speaking for him, uh, I think you have your own uh, perspective on this, but what are the main drivers or what were the motivations uh, for that decision to wait for CCIP? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we actually internally prototyped uh, some cross-chain bridging solutions, uh, but ultimately decided um, that b essentially the, the security risk and the amount of maintenance that would go into it um, would, wouldn't, essentially wouldn't be worth it. Um, we're, you know, between the amount of core contributors we have currently, we're already tackling a huge problem with uh, derivatives, liquidity provisioning, building perpetual futures markets, et cetera. Um, most of the biggest hacks recently have all been cross-chain bridging related as well. And because we're already dependent on Chainlink's infrastructure for price feeds, it's sort of a no-brainer to, to use the same infrastructure for cross-chain messaging. Yeah, uh, I think security, Whenever we talk about bridging, it's the first topic a lot of people uh, talk about. And it's also something we are taking our time for, or have been taking our time for developing CCIP. It's not something you just do once when you're coding. It's from the design architecture, coding, deployment, monitoring. Um, so it's, it's really something we didn't try to make any trade-offs uh, in that regard. Um, what CCIP features um, do you think would have helped if we see the last six months even, four of the five biggest hacks in DeFi and, and exploits have been related to, to bridges? What capabilities or features, what aspects of CCIP could have prevented this or could have mitigated these, these issues? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'm aware the, the, uh, the anti-fraud network um, is an aspect of this, that we, we should be able to provision our own nodes to monitor the network. Um, and yeah, essentially all of the security considerations that are already going into the price feeds are, are going to be going into the CCIP infrastructure. So um, that, that, I think, makes the core contributors generally comfortable with it. Um, yeah, but I generally, sort of by, by relying on CCIP, it makes the security of it, um, I'd say, like a second-order concern, right? I mean, it, it's not something that go, we, we can architect the system and send the messages, and don't, uh, it, it doesn't become as much of a concern in how we're, what we're building effectively. No. Yeah, I think CCIP, in to your point, is built on top of uh, OCR, the protocol that we use, off-chain reporting for price feeds to spin up basically uh, decentralized Oracle networks. So it's not that we are building CCIP from scratch completely. It's leveraging that proven technology. So uh, I think that's a big plus. Um, on top of the Synth teleporters, do you see other use cases for CCIP and synthetics? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in the V3 architecture, we're looking at ways that we can uh, synchronize um, d different uh, liquidity pools effectively cross-chain, so just con configuration could be messaged back and forth, um, as opposed to essentially ledgers, which is the teleportation use case, um, or potentially have uh, accounts. Um, we're going to be representing uh, accounts as NFTs, and then so you might synchronize different accounts on different chains in that way. Um, Governance, we're doing on-chain voting, so uh, settling votes cross-chain, or uh, vote tallies cross-chain is another use case, or the outcomes of the ele um, elections or votes. Um, we're also building um, a novel uh, proxy architecture that's sort of inspired by the diamond pattern, where you have a storage contract separate from the uh, like main logic and implementation. So. I could imagine. I, I don't know if this is something we'll actually use on synthetics because we have to. We have like very um, fine-tuned considerations, but I would imagine long term we end up with a uh, framework similar to that, and um, where you have like sort of um, what would you call it, like a post-save uh, cross-chain synchronization hook or something, where for projects that are like less concerned around uh, like latency and front-running, 
you would just be able to, as a developer, generically um, use getter and setter methods, and then like for like an NFT project or something, and then just wherever else you've deployed, it'll just me message back and forth and keep that sort of database layer uh, in sync. So yeah, I think I think there's a, a tons of opportunities for cross chain, uh, but I think from a developer standpoint, the the goal is to sort of abstract that as much as possible. Uh, and same same for users. Yeah, I think once you really go for cross-chain, uh, multi-chain, but then also cross-chain protocol that is more um, agnostic of the blockchain. It's not just for one use case. It is basically your entire protocol and all the capabilities has to be um, support uh, the cross-chain functionality. So, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it's honest, like personally, it's hard for me to imagine DeFi being successful with fragmented liquidity and cross-chain considerations like you, you, it would be weird if like, you tried to friend someone on Facebook, but you had to ask if they were on the AWS hosted version or the Google Cloud hosted version or something. I feel like that's sort of the analogy with this. No, good point. Cool. Um, as we are count counting down to alpha testing in a few weeks, is there anything specifically you're looking forward to on getting your hands on uh, some parts of, of uh, CCIP? I mean, we're, we're just excited to use it. We've looked over some of the documentation in the interface, and frankly, it's very simple, um, as it should be. You know, you just say, here's the data I'd like to send to this address on this chain, and then on the other side, receive the data and process it. So um, yeah, uh, we're, we're excited to get going. Cool. OK. Thank you very much. Um, for the audience, this afternoon, if you're interested in CCIP, at 1.35, there is a session by uh, our head of R&D, Lawrence. Um, who will walk us through the architecture of CCIP, how messages flow back and forth, how it all works under the covers. So highly recommend that one. Thank you. Thanks.